those damn books are heavy, man. Damn books cost too much. All I got left is train fare home. Hey, Hill, mm -hmm. you got any money? So? You gonna buy me lunch? Oh, no. <laughs> How about some redistribution of assets here instead? Say what? A little game of chance? Ooh, not the way I play it, knucklehead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got some time before class. I'm in. All right. What do you say, Hill? Now, we got to have a fish. I'll watch. Thanks. Oh. Watch and learn. Watch and learn. Yeah. Show your seven freckles. I had just <laughs> arrived from Richmond. And there I was, watching Thurgood shoot dice, when I should have known better. Damn it, crap, indeed. Are you a student here? Yes, sir. What's I... your name? Uh, Thurgood Marshall, sir. Mm-hmm. Where were you? What was I supposed to do, whistle? Who the hell was that? That would be old Iron Shoes, dean of the law school. Dean? Dean. Of the law school? Mm-hmm. Charles Houston was the reason I'd gone to Howard, honors graduate of Amherst and the Harvard Law School. He'd taken a shoestring operation and made Howard the first fully accredited Negro law school in the country. Morning, sir. Your name is? Oliver Hill, sir. So glad you could join us, Mr. Hill. Yes, sir. Take a seat. Sit down. Where were you? I had to buy this book. Mr. Marshall. Yes, sir, Dean Houston. Explain to me, if you will, why you are here at Howard Law School. Uh, I want to be a lawyer. <laughs> a lawyer? Why? Why? I don't know. Uh, my brother's gonna be a doctor. And every Negro family needs one of each. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hill. All right, now, Mr. Marshall, you are from Baltimore, aren't you? Yes, sir. Balmer. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you paying, Mr. Marshall, to attend our little Howard Law School and not going tuition free to the prestigious University of Maryland? I happen to be a Negro. <gasps> I see. And Negroes do not attend the University of Maryland, is that correct? No, sir. I mean, yes, sir. <laughs> Negroes don't attend Maryland. Why is that? <laughs> Who knows what that signifies? A lawsuit. Down south somewhere. Louisiana, wasn't it, sir? That's right, 1896. What was it about? Jim Crow. That's a label, not an explanation. <laughs> Segregation, sir. Plessy. Mr. Hill, is why you ride here from Richmond, Virginia in a racially segregated train. Plessy, Mr. Durham, is why no one in this room can eat in most of the restaurants here in the capital of the world's greatest democracy. And Plessy, Mr. Marshall, is the reason it is against the law in 17 states for black children to go to school with white children. There are two kinds of lawyers, gentlemen. There are my kind, and there are parasites on society. Hmm. My kind of lawyer is going to be a social engineer. My kind of lawyer is going to be a fighter for social change. My kind of lawyer is going to find out everything there is to know about Plessy, because Plessy is a dragon, gentlemen, and my kind of lawyer is going to go out and slay it. That's why you're here, Mr. Marshall. Or it had better be. And if it's not, you'd better pack up and leave right now because you will not make it. I want each one of you to take a look to your right. What? Now look to your left. What's going on? In three years, two of you won't be here. 
I noticed that some of you are sporting men. <coughs> well, those are your odds. He called you a parasite? Yeah! And what did you do to deserve that? Nothing. Well, he caught me shooting crafts. Thurgood, your mother sold her engagement ring so you could go to Howard. Don't you go messing around like you did in college. Buster, honey, I did well in college. Yeah, finally, after almost getting kicked out. Thurgood, like the rest of us, got the message. Had to. From the start, Dean Houston had us up and arguing the ins and outs of segregation cases, especially Plessy. Now, the accommodations in the Negro car are the same as those in the whites-only car. They are separate, but they are equal. Well, no objective observer would call those accommodations equal, Your Honor. But that's not the point. My client, Mr. Homer Plessy, preferred to sit in the car designated whites-only and was arrested in violation of his constitutional rights. His client, Homer Plessy, purposely broke the laws of the state of Louisiana. But that law requires whites to sit in one car, Negroes to sit in another. That's discriminatory. It violates the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. Can Mr. Hill refresh my memory? Tell me exactly what the 14th Amendment says. Exactly? Well, since your entire case rests upon it, I don't think that's unreasonable. No state shall make or enforce any law which abridges the privileges of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deny to any person the equal protection of the law. Okay, counsel. What does the 14th Amendment have to say about the segregation law that Mr. Plessy broke? The 14th Amendment says that the state of Louisiana can't legislate away the rights and privileges given him by the federal government. And just what rights are we talking about? The right to be treated the same as any other person. Not as a second-class citizen, a social... Parasite. <laughs> I mean, social inferior. Look, under the 14th Amendment, the law can't deprive us of freedoms other people have, I mean, you know, simply because we're Negroes. Well, can it? No, well, no, the Supreme Court ruled eight to one that they can keep you from going places white people can go. Racially separate facilities may be maintained by the states as long as they are equal. Segregation is not discrimination. So, everybody's equal, but Negroes can be treated like outcasts. I mean, that's, well, that's the just... the Supreme Court said that the guarantee of equality has limits. It does not require social equality. But I don't see how that comes from the 14th Amendment, Dean Houston. Oh, they said that was self-evident. Self-evident? What, that, that white people are more equal than Negro? Well, the courts thought that was all in your mind, Mr. Marshall. And I quote, the assumption that enforced separation stamps the colored race with a badge of inferiority, they said, is solely because the colored race chooses to put that construction upon it. We chose. Easy, Mr. Marshall. Lose your temper, lose your case. For 35 years, the Supreme Court of the United States has resisted every attempt to overcome segregation by saying, see, Plessy. Every attempt to overturn the last vestiges of the slave codes by saying, see, Plessy. Every attempt to open that door just a little bit so that we can become the people that we know we can become by saying, see, Plessy. If you survive here, gentlemen, you will join a handful of Negro lawyers in this whole country who have been rigorously trained. And with that distinction comes a truly enormous responsibility. We have to change the laws that keep our people down. We must pave the way to the future. Without education, there is no hope for our people. And without hope, our future is lost. So we must use the power and the logic of the law to stop the humiliation and the crippling of our children in disgraceful segregated schools. And we're going to have to accomplish this in the face of a Congress dominated by segregationists. We'll have to face the fact that no president since Abraham Lincoln has fought for Negro rights. And what that means is this. We're going to have to go to court, to the highest court in the land, to destroy Plessy. And we're going to have to be twice as good as the white lawyers that oppose us at every turn. We must not give in. We must not fail. Gentlemen, congratulations to all of you. My nine survivors.
the men of the class of 1933. Uh, Dean, we got a little something for you. Uh, well, we'll find your old iron shoes out back. <laughs> <laughs> from the class of 1933. When Houston said we must not fail, he meant it. After graduation, he went to New York to work for Walter White in the fledgling NAACP. His job, to direct the legal assault on segregation. Thurgood was just starting out in Baltimore, but business would be slow at first. And when Charlie needed some affordable help, he asked Thurgood to go south with him to document racial conditions and recruit people for the legal campaign. Hey, Buster, honey, turn to your right. Not toward the rose bushes. Uh, where did you get that thing? Ah, I picked it up for Charlie. Hey, now, come down here now. What do you mean? Well, this is for our trip. You're taking a movie camera down there? Well, yeah, Charlie wants to document how bad things are down south. You know, drum up a little support for the legal campaign. You're taking a big risk. Those crackers are crazy enough, Thurgood, without you running around pointing a movie camera at things. Hey, I'm getting combat pay. <laughs> Listen, Thurgood, I know this is important and I know Charlie needs you. But you be smart. Look out for yourself. I need you, too. Hey, I'll be back. Don't gamble away all my money. I'll love you forever. <laughs> You're a Negro, and you're speeding in Chester County, South Carolina. Would you slow down? All right, boys and girls, study your reading lessons while I talk to Reverend Roby and these gentlemen. Now, children, don't make me have to get my strap. You all know how to share books, don't you? Yes, I don't know what you gentlemen expect to see, but I'll be glad to answer if you have a question. Mrs. Moody, excuse me. Where do you get your textbooks? From the white school, when uh, they threw with them. The county won't provide new ones. The county don't provide nothing, sir, but my salary, such as it is. And most people around here are too poor to buy books. Children, you are late again. They walks four miles. Most of the children attend regularly? Yes, sir. Most for the full term. And how long is that? After cotton harvest up to planting time, about three months. How many go on to high school, would you say? Mr. Houston, we ain't got no colored high school in this county. Mm -hmm. 
It was easy documenting conditions. Recruiting people to stand up in court? That was a different story. I uh, appreciate y'all coming out here tonight. I got two friends that I want y'all to meet from up north. Mr. Charles Houston here was the head lawyer of the NAACP. NAACP? Mr. Marshall. Excuse me. Them is race men. Race men? You ain't close we were coming down here to no race men. Calm yourself down. Crackers ain't gonna catch me down here with these troublemaking race men. No, sir. Hey, hold on a minute. Look, these men are here to help us. How do you think they gonna help us? We're lawyers. What he means is that if you go into a court of law with us, we can change things. You can't change no white peoples down here, mister. Sir, what we're trying to say is you have rights, and white folks are denying you those rights. So they rich people talk like you. Then they come looking for us, our children. You tell them. Live it out like it is. My advice. I'm getting out of here. This is Chester, South Carolina. 68 pupils in one room. Maybe a dozen books. No desks, no equipment. This is a white school. One mile away. 30 pupils per classroom. Very light and airy, very well equipped. How'd you get in? Oh, a white fella did it for well, a very large fee. The state of South Carolina spends $332,000 to bus white elementary school kids. For a comparable population of Negroes, they spend a total of $628. Separate but equal, huh? Brutal. Just keep the Negroes poor and ignorant, and they won't get restless. Okay. What do we do? Where do we start? Well, now, Walter, we can't start down there. Segregation is absolutely taken for granted down there. Okay. And we can't start talking about black and white kids going to school together. That's too explosive. Are you saying there's nothing to do? What I'm saying is we can't go at Plessy directly. We have to weaken it, chip away at it first. What do you suggest? We go after the equal part first. See if we can win. Then we hit separate. I see. And if we really want to win, we stay as far away from those little kids' schools as possible. How far away? Graduate schools. Like a law school? Equal law schools. A judge should be able to get the joke, don't you think? <laughs> I'm missing something. How many states do you think are likely to build a first-rate law school for Negroes just to keep us separate? They're not going to spend that kind of money. No, I don't know. It sounds like a long way around to me. I think I have found us a plaintiff. Donald Murray. See if you don't think he's perfect. What do you mean? We brought him here to meet you, Walter. He's waiting in my office right now. Bring him in. And where did you go to college? Amherst College, sir. I graduated with honors. And then you applied to the University of Maryland? Yes, sir. And they rejected him. They told him to try Howard. Excuse me. You have a problem with that? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh -huh. Are you ready to stand up with this, Donald? It'll take time, and there could be some trouble for you. Mr. White, I've worked hard, and my parents have worked hard to get me this far. I want to practice law in Maryland. Dr. Pearson. You stated that as president of the University of Maryland, you personally reviewed Donald Murray's application to the School of Law. Yes, sir, I did. I see. And did you at first recommend that he attend instead the Princess Anne Academy for Negroes? I did. In fact, Princess Anne Academy does not have a law school or even offer any courses on a graduate level, does it, Dr. Pearson? No. 
And you were aware that Mr. Murray, as an honors graduate of Amherst College, was academically qualified for law school, were you not? Yes. Dr. Howell, as dean of the law school, would you agree that your curriculum is designed primarily to prepare students who wish to practice law in the state of Maryland? I'd say we want to equip our graduates to practice anywhere. Well, I have a copy of your catalog here. Most of the courses focus on Maryland state code, correct? A majority of the courses, yes. So anyone who wished to practice law around here, as Mr. Murray has testified that he does, would be deprived of invaluable training if denied admission to the Maryland School of Law, would he not? Well, I, uh... As far as I know, there's only one Maryland School of Law. Is that not true, Dean Howell? Well, I must say, I don't think there'd be sufficient, uh, demand to justify a separate law school for Negroes in Maryland. The law says equal, sir. It says nothing about level of demand. I can't speak to what the law says. Dean Howell, in a Jim Crow state, if only a few Negroes choose to travel by train, should not there be cars for them? No, there should not. What would you have them ride in? Ox carts? I suppose. If the ox carts were about as good as the railroad cars, yes, I think I would. Now, Your Honor, we are not here to challenge the Plessy decision. Although many rulings have supported the separate part of separate but equal, the equal part has never been tested to see if equal means equal. And so we are testing it here and now. This court herewith orders President Raymond Pearson to admit Donald Murray Cullen to the law school at the University of Maryland. They won. But the decision only applied to one state. So, after the triumph and celebration of the moment, Charlie and Thurgood would have to start all over again, looking for another case, one they could take all the way to the United States Supreme Court. In the meantime, there was another problem. So, what did the doctor say? Charlie kept pressing on in spite of his health problem, looking for the perfect case. Months passed. All we got is one judge in one state to tell one law school that if separate isn't equal, it can't be separate. All right. We got to find us another case to take us to the Supreme Court. Now, obviously, we can't depend on universities to appeal all the way up, so we have to assume that we'll be the ones to appeal. Follow? So, we need a case we can lose. Yep, a good case we can lose. Charlie. Charlie. Go home. Finally, they found Gaines versus Missouri, the case that got them to the high court in 1938. There, Charlie argued that segregating states should be required to provide Negroes with equal educational facilities. The University of Missouri had refused to allow Lloyd Gaines to enter its law school. But they said they'd pay, if necessary, for Mr. Gaines to attend law school in a neighboring state. The Missouri court found that quite a reasonable offer and ruled against Mr. Gaines. Your honors, if Missouri offers its white citizens a law school, it must also offer its Negro citizens a law school every bit as good. And it can't dismiss the problem by saying to Mr. Gaines, now you just run on over to Kansas, Nebraska, or Iowa, and they'll take care of you over there. Missouri itself must provide for Mr. Gaines. Henrietta, Charlie's new wife, watched as Charlie got the court to agree. His strategy had worked. And we were right on course. Until... Look, you're gonna have to take care of yourself, Charlie. You can't fool around with a heart condition. Now, we'd pick up more of the load if you'd let us. You're gonna pick up more than that, Mr. Marshall. I'm leaving the NAACP, and you're gonna take my job. Wait, Charlie. 
I'm only 30 years old. I'm still an apprentice. No, we, we, we gotta find somebody else. Who knows the strategies better than you? Who found the plaintiffs? Who researched the law? Who mapped out the plea? And you know everything I did, I did under your guidance. And you will still have that. You don't have any choice, Mr. Marshall. I already talked it over with Walter White. <laughs> Ladies! Somebody cheer this man up. Poor fella just got a promotion and he feels depressed. A promotion? <laughs> Two. It changed everything. We fought overseas, mostly in segregated units. But especially in Europe, we found ourselves for the first time in an unsegregated world. Many of us came back with new ideas about how things should be at home. Like Heeman Sweat, like Harry Briggs, like Robert Carter, who came to work for Thurgood. <laughs> Texas Law School. Another law school? You have a better idea, Walter? Very good. My boy thinks you're being too cautious. They want you to go after Plessy directly. They want action on segregation. And they think I don't? Does the board have a strategy to suggest? Does the board have plaintiffs lined up? Does the board have a case in mind? No, the board does not. Did you listen to the fight last night, Charlie? Oh, that's Sugar Ray Robinson, and that's a boxer. Lightning hands and jabbing and popping. Piling up points. He's quick, but he buys his time. Well, that's his style. And it works, too. Seven, eight rounds, the other guy's legs start to go. Sugar Ray moves and puts him away. Yeah, you know. Well, Walter White wants me to be Joe Lewis. One shot, haymaker. How's that? Well, he still thinks this sweat case ain't worth it. Human sweat, the guy they put in the basement? Yeah. Very good. Maybe it's time for you to press the court, find out what equal really means. For instance, who does sweat talk to? Discuss things with when he's alone. One step at a time, remember? OK. Your honors. Heeman Sweat, a resident of Texas, desired merely to obtain the best legal education the state had to offer. He was denied admission to the University of Texas Law School and was eventually shown to the Texas State Law School for Negroes that had been hastily established to meet this court's mandate of educational equality. Counsel, Mr. Uh, Marshall, I believe the court is familiar with the facts. Now, in your brief, you argue that this court should overrule 50 years of constitutional law, beginning with Plessy versus Ferguson. Now, that wouldn't be necessary, would it, if colored students in Texas could attend a bona fide accredited colored law school in the state? Chief Justice, first, I'm sure that we'd all agree that the state of Texas will never build a black law school equal in facilities, and certainly not equal in terms of faculty and prestige, to the University of Texas, one of the most heavily endowed law schools in this country. But second, we say that even if they did, that would not be enough. Segregated schools can never be equal. The Negro school invariably carries a stigma of inferiority. In practice, it always means separate and unequal. For the state of Texas to offer Mr. Sweat an equal education, they would have to offer him the same professors, the same discussions, and a chance to interact with all the other students of the law. That might be arguable for a graduate school of law. But what are you driving at, Mr. Marshall? 
If this court were to accept your position, isn't the next logical step for you to demand racial integration of children in the elementary and secondary schools? That case is not before the court. Just the same. If we were to overrule Plessy, wouldn't that require nationwide desegregation of all public schools at every level? That would be the broadest possible reading. Well, Mr. Marshall, are you asking for that broad relief? Or simply for a ruling in favor of your client, Mr. Sweat? It is our position, Mr. Justice Frankfurter, that this court should re-examine Plessy. However, foremost in this case is relief for Mr. Sweat. Did you see the way they've jumped all over me? Did that tell you something? Mm -hmm. Thurgood, Henrietta's been trying to reach you. Charlie Houston had a heart attack. Hey, counselor. Thurgood. Hi, Henrietta. How's this man behaving? Well, for a change. Oh. Hi, Bo. How you doing? Not so good. Ooh, your boy is growing like a weed. Mm -hmm. You're going to start school pretty soon, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> all right. How are things going court today, counselor? Well, I talked Plessy and they jumped all over me. You would have loved it. <laughs> Come on, Bo, honey. Daddy wants to talk with Uncle Thurgood. We'll go down and get some ice cream, OK? I don't want ice cream, Mommy. Bo, Bo, you go with your mama. Come on now. Come on, sweetie. Oh, yes. Very good. Maybe we made a mistake. Hell, they never intended for us to be a part of the mainstream in this country. My whole lifetime. How much has changed? Oh. We made a good start, Charlie. Listen. A couple of weeks ago, I took Bo to the drugstore down the street. Mm -hmm. Bought myself a pack of cigarettes. He ran over to the soda fountain and hoisted himself up on one of them stools. Oh, <laughs> oh he spun around. He was having such a wonderful time. Just laughing. <laughs> this fat, red-faced soda jerk comes swooping down on him and says, says, Get down from there, you little digger. I looked at Bo. He looked at me. I saw the hurt and fear in his eyes. What could I do? Nothing. Nothing. They're good. Look after my boy.
millions of Negroes may never know that this man dedicated his life to improving theirs. Charles Houston saw a society that refused to live by its own principle. He saw a nation that said all men are created equal, but used the law to keep some of its people down. Charles Houston said the law of this land cannot be permitted to do that. And he set out on a legal crusade to carry his people to racial equality. Charles Houston inspired and trained dozens of lawyers. Sometimes he scared us too. But he dedicated us to that crusade. Now we, those lawyers, we are the true heirs of Charles Hamilton Houston. And his legacy to us is the same charge he gave us years ago to use the law, the power, and the logic of the law to deliver our people from centuries of injustice and to restore to them their right to learn, to achieve, to excel. and to be respected as human beings. Two months after we laid Charlie Houston into rest, the Supreme Court ruled that there was more to equal education than buildings and books. The University of Texas Law School possesses not only superior facilities, but also certain intangible qualities that make for greatness in a law school. These qualities include reputation of the faculty, standing in the community, and prestige. Therefore, Eamon Sweat is ordered admitted to the University of Texas Law School. However, we do not reach the petitioner's contention that in, in the, the light, light of contemporary, contemporary knowledge knowledge respecting the effects of racial segregation, Plessy versus Ferguson should be re-examined. Well, Thurgood, you were right. You got him to take a big step beyond equal facilities there. No, you were right, Walter. Mm. We got to go after Plessy directly. We got to say that's what we want, and we can't give them any way to skip around it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how the hell we're going to do that, but that's <laughs> what we got to do. <laughs> Thurgood was about to get some unexpected help. Down in Clarendon County, South Carolina, a farmer named Levi Pearson stood up with NAACP lawyer Harold Bullwear to ask for a school bus. Levi, we're behind you all the way. All rise. U.S. District Court Clarendon County is now in session. Judge Edgerton J. Fowler presiding. Pearson versus the Clarendon County Board of Education. The court is dismissing this case. <laughs> Mr. Bullway, your client has no legal standing to bring this case. Your Honor, Mr. Pearson has two children in school district 26. Mr. Pearson's farm is on the line between district 26 and district 5. And according to tax receipts presented to me by the defendant, he pays his property taxes in district 5 which is his legal residence. He sends his children to the wrong school. He's not qualified to bring this suit. If it pleases the court, the evidence in this case is not limited to where Mr. Pearson pays his taxes. Counselor, you are out of order. Your case has been dismissed. 
Bailiff. Wait a minute, Your Honor. This ain't right. All we asking for is a school bus. Your Honor, Levi Pearson's children are in my classroom in District 26, and they've been there for years. Now, you just hold it right there. You want me to put you away for a while? Next case, Zimmerman versus McKay. Looks like some of our Negroes don't even know where they live. <laughs> Evening, folks. I am very glad to see you here tonight. It is a vote of confidence, which we may not entirely deserve after Mr. Pearson's court experience. Mr. Marshall, we made a mistake. So did we. We should never have tied a case to one person. Mr. Marshall, I believe Mr. Bullwell was trying to save other parents from reprisal. Yes, sir. Yes. I understand. Well, what do you want us to do now? Mr. Marshall, we want to know what you think we should do. It depends. How much you want to stand up to white folks? How fast do you want to go? I was raised on Booker T. Washington's advice. Be industrious and law-abiding. Don't give the white man any cause to abuse you. <laughs> now, I followed that advice for 40 years. Then I stand up with Levi, and they burn my house down. I was in the Army. Fought the Nazis for three years. And the French peoples appreciated me treated me like a man. And then I come home, and I'm treated like dirt. And with the court with Levi, and the man fired me and my wife from our jobs. Now, I believe that you all came here tonight to start trying to change things for your children. Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. I know you did, Harry Briggs. Yes, sir. I'm here to stand up for my children. OK. Now, you asked the school board for a few buses. Yes, sir. Now, do you want to try for equal books? Yes, and equal teachers' pay? Yes, equal school building? Yes. Or do you want to fight to get your kids the exact same schooling white kids get. There you go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, the only way you're going to get that is in the same school, together. Now, you know white folks ain't going to take that sitting down. They're going to come after you, and they're going to keep coming after you. We're leaving here tomorrow. But you all have got to live here. Mr. Marshall, my children's get the short end of the stick. And I don't mean to put up with it no more. Mr. Marshall, you decide what to say in court. You, you know about those things. Just tell us what we have to do. Well, we need to make this a group action. We need about 20 of you as qualified plaintiffs. You count on me. What I sign? I'm putting my name down. All right. The thing sure are changing in South Carolina. The last time I was down here, everybody was scared to death. Mr. Marshall, all the scared niggas done already moved. To Chicago. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all, right. all right, good people. I think we have got ourselves a deal. Thurgood went back to New York and gave Walter White what he had been waiting for. In June 1950, the NAACP announced a bold new initiative 
an all-out attack on school segregation, they were going after Plessy itself. Some of our people were afraid it would backfire, but folks were beginning to stand up. In Topeka, Kansas, a welder named Oliver Brown tried to enroll his daughter Linda in a white school in his neighborhood. He was turned away. We took the case. In Prince Edward County, Virginia, Barbara Johns, a junior at Rundown Moton High School, led the entire student body out on strike. Carrie, you go first. Tell them what we saw at the white kids' school, and I'll tell everybody we want them out on strike and to stay out until we get some action. Okay. Barbara, I know what you got in mind. Miss Richardson. Please, this will only bring trouble. Miss Richardson, we know what we're doing. Our teachers have tried, our parents have tried, and if we don't do something, nothing will ever change. But you can't just I'm expect... sorry, Miss Richardson. This is what we're doing, and we don't have much time. Barbara wrote to my office in Richmond for help. Those students became our plaintiffs in Virginia. With all of this activity, Thurgood happily called in more help. Well, Bill Coleman. Thurgood. Come on in. <laughs> How you doing? Let's meet Jack Greenberg. He just joined nice us. Nice night. Jack. Robert Carter. Uh, Mr. Carter. So how are things in Philly, Bill? Oh, man, I moved up to New York. Couldn't get anybody in Philly to hire me. Oh. I know how that goes. Mm -hmm. Harvard Law Review. <coughs> well, well. Former law clerk to Felix Frankfurt, eh? Mm -hmm. You can't be that, Mr. Coleman. I mean, you a darky, ain't you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> we sure as hell can use you. No one knows the Supreme Court like this man, inside or out. What was your problem in Topeka, Jack? We got a group of Negro teachers that say if we win, they'll lose their jobs. Well, it could be right. So, some of our plaintiffs are talking about backing out. What? Well, we can't lose Topeka. Well, that's for sure. If you are trying for a Supreme Court decision that applies to all the segregating states, you're going to have to go in with three or four good cases. Jack, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> you're going to have to find some way to convince them. We talk about it. Did you read the South Carolina brief? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. And it is, um, well, it's weak. How? It is if you're going for the Supreme Court. Look, we already know that segregation is wrong. But the question is, how is it unlawful? You see, I don't see the basic legal argument here. It's straight line 14th Amendment. Segregation is discrimination. Discrimination is unequal treatment thereby damaging the Negro student. So, you're gonna have to prove that discrimination has damaged your client in a way that violates the 14th Amendment. Well, we can prove damages, all right. How are you gonna do that? Using social science evidence. Man, are you serious? <laughs> sure. I mean, there are a lot of new studies out now, and uh, we can have experts testify. Experts? Come on, man, I could see experts testifying in tangible matters. I I'm talking about uh, equal facilities and pay scales. Oh, and that's come on, man. Bob, Bob, Bob. Who do you have in mind? Kenneth Clark. Dr. Kenneth Clark. So, with the psychological tests, Dr. Clark, you... Ken, please. Well, Ken, you show that discrimination hurts the Negro children by creating a, no, by causing a feeling of inferiority, which impairs their ability to learn. Oh, absolutely. And these feelings grow into self-hatred and ultimately into despair? No question. It starts at an early age, four or five. And of course, the earlier it starts, the, the more permanently damaging it is. Uh, very good, Dr. Clark is testing children for 12 years. Well, what do you think, Bill? Gentlemen, with all due respect to the good doctor, you will be laughed out of court. Dr. Clark, you use these little dolls, don't you, in your experiment? Mr. Coleman, my findings are consistent with and supported by a large, a large body of research. Whatever your opinion of my methods, most experts would find merit in them. Gentlemen, if you are going to succeed at the Supreme Court, you are going to need Mr. Justice Frankfurter on your side. Now, that is a fact. 
Felix Frankfurter will not buy anything that is not grounded in precedent. And if there's one thing that raises his hackles, it's the suspicion that some lawyer is running a carnival sideshow. I'm sorry, but this social science voodoo is not science, and it sure as hell is in law. This is not voodoo. This is about damage, real damage to real children. Thurgood, please. Bill, you ever read the Negro Press? The Pittsburgh Courier. You ever seen Dr. Fred Palmer's ad? Be lighter. Be lovelier. Be love. Dr. Fred Palmer's new double strength skin whitener. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Does that say damage to you? Mr. Marshall. Oh, yeah? You don't look that old to me. Oh, yes, sir. He taught me all the tricks. Well, you know, you worked this job for a while, didn't you? That's right, a couple of summers. Yeah, I remember my first day, white man that hired me gave me a pair of pants, came halfway up my shims. I complained to the head steward, and he said, boy, they can get a man to fit those pants a lot easier than they can get some pants to fit you. You're just gonna have to try it. Scrunch down in them a little bit more. <laughs> 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 well, that means you're almost a railroad man. And, sir, I want you to know we do appreciate what you're doing. Well, thank you. I appreciate Tell that. Me. What's this? Uh, compliments of all the stewards. We heard you were coming. Well, all right. Very nice. Oh, yeah. I'd love to wait for it, but you know, to the railroad, man. One sugar, please. Are we still in Virginia? No, sir. We just crossed into North Carolina. Way, way below the Mason Dixon line. Yeah, the Smith and Wesson line. Hey, doctor, you look like you've never been way down south before. Only once. I tested some children in a couple of cities in Arkansas. Say that again? Well, most of my testing has been done in northern cities. You mean you never tested rural black children in the south? No, I, I haven't. Well, I thought you knew. Thurgood Ken's test results are very consistent. There's no reason to believe these children down in Clarendon County are going to test any differently. There are lots of reasons. These are farm kids. And the Negroes in Clarendon County are in the majority. Six to one. In four days, we go into court in Charleston, maybe without a case. That'll be fine right over there. Cost me 50 cents a piece at a five and diamond hall. Hey, I'll be the lookout. Okay. Oh, God, wow. Hello there. Hi. What's your name? Ginny. Ginny. That's a nice name. I'm Dr. Clark. Do you like dolls, Ginny? Do you have any dolls? <coughs> no dolls at all? Once I had one, she out. Well, I have some dolls here. You want to see? Come on, I'll show you. 
Do you want to play a game, dolls? Okay. I'm going to ask you some questions, and you tell me the answers. You ready? Okay. Which one is the boy doll? Which one is the girl doll? Good. Which one is the colored doll? And Jenny, I want you to hand me the doll that you'd like to play with. This one. Now, give me the nice doll. Give me the doll that looks bad. All right. Now, give me the doll that looks most like you. Like me? This one looks most like you. Give me the doll that you would rather play with, Eloise. Fine. Now, give me the doll that looks bad to you. Bad? Well, yes. There's one that you don't like as well because of the way it looks. Thank you. Now, which one of the dolls do you think looks most like you? Just show me the doll that looks like you. I don't want to. Why? is over anyway. May 1951 was our first real test in court. Negroes stood in line and packed the court in Charleston to hear what we had come up with to fight segregation. As risky as Thurgood knew it was, our strategy in each case would rest heavily upon the testimony of social science experts. Well, if it pleases the court, uh, before we begin these proceedings, I want to make a statement. Now, we concede that the educational facilities for the colored children in Clarendon County are not equal to those of the white children. May it please the court, this is just an attempt to sidestep the issue. Your honors, uh, the legislature has just passed Governor Burns' bill to finance the equalization of schools. All we ask is just a reasonable time to achieve those goals. Your Honors, that has no bearing on this trial. Now, we contend that these schools are not merely physically unequal. We will show that segregation in and of itself is a form of inequality. Order! Order in the courtroom! Your Honors, this state-sanctioned, state Mandated discrimination wounds and cripples innocent children. It denies those segregated the equal protection of the law, which under the 14th Amendment is the birthright of all American citizens. Order! Uh, I've cleared this courtroom. Okay, Mr. Marshall. 
We'll hear what you have to say. Segregation destroys a Negro child's self-esteem. Because he is constantly reminded that he is an inferior human being, he may come to despise himself and hate the whites. Now, Dr. Clark, have you... Uh, excuse me. Uh, segregation also affects the child who belongs to the discriminating group, the white child. How is the white child affected? Well, the same people who are teaching him democracy, uh, brotherhood, to love his fellow man, are also teaching him to segregate. There's a lot of confusion, naturally, and feelings of guilt. Uh, Dr. Clark, having tested the Negro students involved in this case, what are your conclusions about them? These six- and seven-year-old children suffer to a most appalling degree from self-hatred. And this has a paralyzing effect on the growth of their personalities. This type of injury, in your opinion, is it likely to endure? In my opinion, this type of wound stays raw for a lifetime. Thank you very much, Doctor. Dr. Clark, let's see. Now, you talked to uh, how many children last week? I tested 26. 26 you talked to. And uh, how many students are there in the schools of Clarendon County? Hmm? I don't know. Hmm. Well, Your Honors, there are 61 Negro schools in the county uh, with a total enrollment of over 6,000 pupils. Now, uh, now, Dr. Clark, do you think uh, 26 is a fair sampling? Yes, I, I believe it was. Oh, and these uh, 26 students' responses forced you to the conclusion that they were being uh, irreparably uh, damaged by attending segregated schools in Clarendon County? Because they are segregated, they see themselves as being generally inferior. Negro children, unlike white children, expect to be rejected. Your Honors, I have never, ever heard testimony like this in a court of law. I'm sorry, but I, I don't know what else to ask this gentleman. Thank you. Dr. Lane, your efforts here will be rewarded. Oh, thank you, Dr. Clark. Thank you. And Mr. Carter. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, oh, we thank you all, Mr. Oh, Marshall. Yeah, well, we're a long way from home. It'll probably be several months before we even get a decision from here. Are we going to win, Mr. Marshall? Well, someday, you know, uh, how you doing? Glad you all came down. Probably not here now, Harry. You know, we want Meanwhile, to Carter and Greenberg would handle the Brown case in Topeka, Hello, but they wouldn't doing? have Ken Clark. How you doing, darling? Help us get and some other key court. experts we were also Both proving them. hard to get. Hey, how... We don't have Dr. Manager? He says he's on our side, but he also says that he doesn't want to come unless he's subpoenaed. It's too close to home. What about uh, the big guy in Minnesota? Ronald Rose. He just changed his mind. Look, Jack, they weren't ready for us in South Carolina, but sooner or later they're going to come after us. Now, who do we have? Dr. Louisa Holt. Rose recommended her. Uh-huh. Bob, she's the best we can do. Dr. Holt. Dr. Louisa Holt, Bob Carter. A pleasure to meet you, Doctor. I know I'm here by default. There's so many other social scientists better qualified than I. Well, we're lucky to have you, Doctor. This way, please. Pardon me, ma'am. Give the court your name, please. Oliver Brown. Are you a resident of Topeka, Kansas, Mr. Brown? Yes, sir. 511 First Street. Mr. Brown, do you have a child enrolled in the public schools of Topeka? I do. She goes to Monroe School, about a mile away. That's a Negro school? Yes, sir. How does Linda get to school, Mr. Brown? She walks across the Rock Island Railroad Switching Yard. I worry because it's dangerous. She's only seven years old. All right. Is there a school for children Linda's age in the neighborhood, Mr. Brown? Yes, a white school, Sumner School. And did you take Linda one day to seek admission at the Sumner School? I did. And what happened, Mr. Brown? They threw us out.
Now, Mrs. Holt, you say that the mere fact that Negro students attend separate schools makes them inferior? That's not what I said. I, I said... Well, you contend that it affects the learning process. I certainly do. Well, now. That could rationalize the lower test scores of Negro students, couldn't it, Mrs. Holt? It doesn't rationalize a thing. How do you know who you are? You get an image of yourself by how other people react to you, what they say about you. If day after day you face nothing but negative responses, you have to begin to internalize them. You feel inferior. I see. Now, Mrs. Holt, you are aware that here in Topeka, the students are, in fact, integrated at the junior high level. Yes, of course. And I suppose you're going to tell me that that doesn't correct your problem. It's not my problem, Mr. Goodell, but absolutely that does not correct it. The earlier such a deep wound is inflicted, the less likely it is ever to heal. But the real problem is... Your Honor... No, I'll let her finish. What is most destructive about school segregation at any level is that it's legal. Its legality makes it more destructive. Our government is approving, giving legal sanction to a policy that has to be seen by white people and Negroes as proof that Negroes are inferior. Well, I must admit, she was a tiger. You see the way Judge Huxman listened to her. Cadell could lay a glove on her. Well, all I can think now is the bad guys must be saving their best shots for Virginia. Bob Carter was right. The attorney for Virginia, T. Justin Moore, had scouted the earlier trials, and he was out to whip and humiliate us if he possibly could. Dr. Shine, you have testified that in a survey of psychologists, a majority agreed that enforced segregation makes Negroes feel inferior. Is that correct? Uh, that, that's correct, Mr. Moore, 90%. Dr. Shan, let me ask you, just how do you spell your last name? C-H-E-I-N. What kind of name is that? Oh, are you asking am I Jewish? Yeah, I am. All right. Let's take the Jews. They have been discriminated against, have they not? Yes. Is your view then that Jews also feel inferior as to status? Oh, yes, sir. You really believe that? No, I not only believe it, but I have evidence to that effect. As a matter of fact, in the social science literature, the very notion of self-hate first appeared in connection with the study of Jews. Tell me, Dr. Clark, why can't the Negro have great pride of race? Why does he want, I suggest, to be a suntanned white man? Objection. Excuse me, Your Honor. I would like to answer that. Go ahead. What the Negro wants is to be treated like a human being. The Negro, Mr. Moore, will take pride in being a Negro when his own government stops humiliating him. Dr. Clark, these... 16 Prince Edward students you interviewed. They give you the answers you were looking for? What are you asking me? Excuse me, Mr. Moore. Dr. Clark, did you select or coach any of the children? No, Your Honor. Can you seriously ask this court to believe that your interviews prove anything at all? Except that kids, all kids, whatever their color, like to complain about their school. Now, how can you dignify this farce by describing it as evidence? Objection. Oh, I'll withdraw that question. But, Your Honors, we're not going to allow this so-called expert testimony to go into the record unchallenged. We'll call our own witness who will prove conclusively that there is no sound scientific basis for it. Dr. Garrett, you are president, are you not, of the American Psychological Association? I am. And you are head of the Department of Psychology at Columbia University. 
I am. Very well then, Dr. Garrett. Have you known any of the plaintiff's witnesses previously? I have. Several have been my students, including Dr. Clark. Then, Dr. Garrett, as a world-recognized authority in social psychology, and as Dr. Clark's mentor, do you see his test results presented here as proof that segregation stunts a student's emotional growth? It pains me to have to say this, but I find no such proof. Dr. Garrett, can a Negro get a satisfactory education in segregated schools? Yes. In fact, it seems to me today in Virginia, given the customs of its people, that Negroes will get a better education in separate schools, given equal facilities. Now, Dr. Garrett, uh, segregated education has been represented here as something alien in our democracy. Do you see it in that light? The principles of separation education are well established in America. Boys and girls are taught in separate schools. Catholic children attend parochial schools. Jewish children go to Hebrew schools. No stigma attaches. Thank you, Dr. Garrett. Dr. Garrett, do you know of any situation involving segregation of Negroes where the stigma of inferiority has not attached? I don't think any such stigma need attach. I think if the Negroes had equal facilities in the high schools of Virginia, the Negroes would develop their schools up to the level where they would not want to mix. They would develop their sense of dramatic art and music, which they seem to have talent for, and athletics. And they would say, we prefer to remain as a Negro group. I would like to see that happen. I think it would be poetic justice. Let me ask you directly, Dr. Garrett. Do you believe that Negroes are inherently inferior to whites? Oh, I'll object to that. No, I'll allow it. Well, I, I can't. No, of course not. No further questions, Your Honor. One week after the Virginia trial was done, decisions from the, all the lower court cases were in. No surprise in South Carolina. We lost in Virginia, too. This court finds that racial separation in Virginia rests neither upon prejudice nor caprice, but for generations has been part of the customs of her people. We have looked... But from the judge in Topeka, Kansas, came some hopeful words. Segregation of white and colored children in the public schools is detrimental to the colored children. The impact is greater when it has the sanction of law. However, in the recent Sweat case, the Supreme Court made it clear that it was confining its rulings to graduate schools only. Plessy, Plessy has, has not, not been, been overruled and is still the authority permitting a segregated school system in the lower grades. Therefore, the plaintiff's prayer for relief is denied. So he's saying, but for Plessy, he would have ruled in our favor. He's saying. He can't reverse Plessy. But the Supreme Court can. Well, we'll just have to see if those nine distinguished white men want to talk about it. We now had three cases we hoped would be accepted by the Supreme Court. And a few months later, the court met to consider them. I feel strongly that we should not hear these cases now. Felix, we've avoided confronting these issues far, far too long. I agree. I think it's time we do our job. Our job? I'm not convinced that this is a matter for disposition by the courts. Well said. It's going to be very difficult to thrash this out, Felix, but it's necessary. And as Bill says, it's time we faced up to it. May I have a show of hands? seem to have the necessary four votes. All right, the cases will be consolidated and put on the fall docket. And following tradition, we will refer to them collectively as 
Briggs versus Elliot. Uh, Chief, uh, that's alphabetical, yes, but in this matter, in order to emphasize the geographical variety, uh, might I suggest that instead of South Carolina, the Kansas case be given pride of place? Oh, oh Felix, you, you're splitting hairs. I'm trying to take the pressure off the South, Bill. Excellent suggestion, Felix. Thank you, sir. Any objections? All right, then. Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka. When it was announced that the court would hear cases involving school desegregation, opposition was immediate. Do you want your children sitting next to some filthy, nappy-headed, big-lipped, sex-crazed nigger heathen? Hell no! Well, we say to the damn Supreme Court, you just try and put one goddamn nigger into our schools, and we'll kill the nigger and burn down the school. But maybe the worst news was that the great John W. Davis, a man who had won 140 cases in the high court, who literally wrote the book on how to win there, he would oppose Thurgood in the oral arguments. You don't smoke enough all day, now you gotta stay up and smoke all night, too? You know who this man is? I remember. You used to cut class to go and hear him argue at the Supreme Court. Charlie Houston used to tell us, you got to be twice as good as the white lawyer. Twice as good. Hell, a lawyer never lived who was twice as good as John W. Davis. You go on ahead to bed, and I'll be along. I got to find something. They're good. Charlie chose you. I chose you. I think we were both right. You'll be ready for it. Yeah. Is that really your set? Oh, my. I see. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. I'm sorry I took so long. I hope this isn't cold. Hmm? What a handsome man. Best in the business. But I wish we didn't have to go ahead with this case at all. That was the governor of South Carolina. I can imagine dear Jimmy Burns getting upset. This is a threat to Dixie as we know and love it. Well, you don't understand, dear. Jimmy is going to have to make an announcement today that he'll close the schools rather than desegregate. After he spent all that money improving the colored schools in South Carolina? That's the whole point, dearest. This whole thing could very well backfire on the Negroes. They could kill the public school system in the South. There could be a violent and bloody death. What can you do? I don't know. The court is so deeply split. There's no leadership. And if Douglas and Hugo Black get their wish, well, it smells like disaster to me. Thank you. 
Your Honors, state laws which require racially segregated schools deny Negroes equal protection of the law. Now, the lower courts in South Carolina, Kansas, and Virginia all cited one Supreme Court decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, which we contend turned its back on the 14th Amendment. The Plessy Doctrine relegated Negroes to second-class citizenship and has been used ever since to keep Negroes down. We believe that Plessy should be overturned. Now, this court has itself recently contradicted Plessy. In Sweat versus Painter, you found unanimously that what the University of Texas had denied Mr. Sweat extended far beyond equal facilities. You said unanimously there is more to equal education than the same books and similarly qualified teachers. You recognized unanimously certain intangibles in law schools like reputation, standing in the community, even the opportunity to exchange views and ideas with other students. Mr. Marshall, any lawyer, certainly any justice, knows from experience the importance of those factors in a graduate school of law. But I think we've been through this before. What do they have to do with children and public schools? Your Honor, we argue that Negro children are especially handicapped by laws which set them apart. Now, you've seen in the records from the lower courts abundant expert testimony from eminent social scientists confirming the psychological damage caused by segregation. Schooling, which should enrich the lives of Negro children, open doors for them to participate fully in our society, instead demeans them and cripples them. Mr. Marshall, I don't care how much social science testimony you have. You're asking this court to take away from 21 states the right to determine their own social policy. Mr. Justice Jackson, we are just following the court's own logic about what constitutes equal protection in the sweat case and applying the same principle to children. Now, Mr. Marshall, surely you have to consider where these segregation laws came from. Uh, weren't they passed for the purpose of avoiding racial friction? Well, Mr. Justice Reed, I'm sure that the people who wrote those laws would have said that. <laughs> they were thinking of maintaining law and order. Mr. Justice Reed, my point is that in this century to date, no Negro has served in the legislature of any of these segregating states. But behind the school segregation laws, there are certain facts of life, certain customs, especially where there are large numbers of Negroes. Don't you think it helps us to realize that? Your Honor, I can't say it helps us. These school segregation laws reflect attitudes of the past. We're growing up in America. We're beginning to understand and accept each other better. We just fought a war together to end fascist racism abroad. We believe that the time has come to end racism at home. I reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. 
Thank you, Councillor. Now, counsel for the appellants has cited testimony from what he chooses to call expert witnesses, such as Dr. Kenneth Clark, for example, who tested 26 college students in Clarendon County, South Carolina, with white and brown dolls. Now, Dr. Clark concludes that colored children have been irreparably harmed, made to feel inferior. Well, this is distressing news indeed. Your Honors, I am reminded of the wistful lament in scriptures, oh, that mine enemy had written a book. Well, in fact, Dr. Clark has written on this subject and has described a similar testing of colored students in the integrated schools of a northern city. Now, Dr. Clark concludes that 52% of the colored students thought that the white doll was nicer than the colored doll. In the north, 68% thought so. In the South, 49% of the Negro children thought that the colored doll was bad. In the North, 71% thought so. Now, what has become of the crippling influence of segregation? It has vanished. Now, Your Honors, how can we say with certainty that racially segregated education offends the 14th Amendment. Now, Congress framed the 14th Amendment in June of 1866. And the very next month, July of 1866, that very same Congress voted to establish segregated schools in the District of Columbia. And from that good day to this, the Congress has never wavered from this policy. Mr. Davis, 1866 was a long time ago. Conditions change. Isn't it possible that what may have seemed all right, that is, constitutional in 1866, might now be considered unconstitutional? Your Honor, changed conditions certainly may affect the laws as set by Congress and by Congress alone. But changed conditions should not extend the intended reach of the Constitution. As we all understand, it is the responsibility of the court to interpret the laws not to make them. I respectfully submit that no reason is given here for this court to reverse the findings of 80 years. Thank you. Your Honors, for all his eloquence, Mr. Davis has left untouched my chief point. For some reason, the Negro is segregated against his will, is forced into a state of imposed degradation. For some reason, the Negro child is kept out of the mainstream of American life. For some reason, these acts are all condoned by courts which are supposed to respect and protect his rights as a full citizen. You're still asking for a change in social policy, Mr. Marshall. Why isn't this a matter for the Congress? Mr. Justice Jackson, we don't believe it is up to Congress to interpret amendments to the Constitution, amendments that were clearly passed to guarantee full equality before the law for all citizens. The 14th Amendment was specifically passed to guarantee that there would be no subclass of American citizenship. Now, we don't believe that Congress can vote on that. You were just saying that under the Constitution, the individual rights of minorities can never be relegated to the mercies of the majority. That's exactly what I'm saying. So if I or my child is being deprived of our rights, that isn't a legislative problem. That, we contend, is this court's problem. 
What we are asking, Your Honors, is that state-imposed segregation be removed and the local school boards be ordered to work out their solutions to reassign children on any reasonable basis. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Marshall. You brought up the question of remedy. If we reverse Plessy, aren't you saying that would automatically entitle every Negro mother to have her child go to a non-segregated school? Automatically? Not immediately, I don't think. Well, what would happen? Would you mind spelling this out? The school boards would uh, have to find some method to distribute children by drawing district lines, I assume. You assume? Then we would have gerrymandering of the school districts well, to the avoid would have compliance. To be Mr. Marshall, nothing would be more foolish for this court than to have it issue an abstract declaration that segregation is bad only to have it evaded by tricks. I agree, sir, completely. But we, we have to believe the local officials will obey the law. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Mr. Bickle. Good morning, sir. Mr. Bickle. What would you say was the original intention of the 14th Amendment? I, uh, well, I always understood that it was intended to give Negroes the same rights as everybody else. All right, now, did the framers of the amendment intend that it permit segregated schools? Well, one could assume from the I don't assume, Bickle. Yes, sir. I doubt that the framers anticipated the question, but the truth is you don't know, and neither does anybody else. But you're going to find out. Chief. Ah, Felix. I'm sorry, I'm late. That's all right, Larry. Uh, well, brethren, we're all here now, so let's please get started. Uh. Now, we're asked here to reverse Plessy, in spite of the large body of law behind us on separate but equal. But John Davis reminds us the Congress that framed the 14th Amendment also permitted segregated schools in Washington, D.C. So I'm inclined to affirm the lower court rulings. I know my Southern compatriots, and I know there's a deep fear that desegregation will lead directly to the mixing of the races. I also know that the clear purpose of segregation laws is to discriminate. I hold no brief with those who would keep Negroes down to exploit them as laborers and so on. But we must remember the Negro race is out of slavery for only a short time. They still have a lot of catching up to do. So while a body of law has grown up to surround separate but equal with an aura of legitimacy, I find Mr. Marshall's argument persuasive. Racial classification is wrong. Felix? These cases present problems of such uh, immense uh, uh, sensitivity and complexity. And I don't believe, frankly, that either side has really addressed them. They haven't come to grips with the solutions or consequences. Therefore... Oh, you can't believe that. Wait, Felix is making a valid point. Therefore, I am not prepared to vote on these cases today. I recommend that we give both sides a chance to re-argue. A chance? Felix, re-argue what? What could we possibly hear that is new? I mean, we all know what this is about. The legal basis for reaching a decision. It's not that complicated. Well, for some people, nothing is complicated. And for some people, everything is. Chief, 
I think it would be best not to vote today. Well, we are at loggerheads. We will not vote this morning. Felix, we'll take your suggestion under advisement. Great news, Mr. Pickle. We're ordering re-argument. Now, I need your help drafting some questions. What sort of questions? For whom? For both sides to form the basis for the rehearing. How are you progressing on the 14th Amendment? What the framers had in mind. It's slow going, sir. What the hell are they after? Proof that the 14th Amendment was intended to outlaw segregation and that the court has the power to do it. How can you prove that? But they do ask how a remedy might be framed. It's a good sign. Why do they need us to tell them how to do their job? Hell, we won the damn case. They just won't admit it. Sir, good. this is a big job here. We're going to need historians, constitutional scholars. My God, it's going to cost a lot of money. Sometimes I get so goddamn tired of trying to save the white man's soul. That was a long, terrible summer. We lined up dozens of scholars to try to make history serve our argument. I'd seldom seen Thurgood so down. So after the war was over, to get back into the Union, all the Confederate states framed new constitutions, and not one has a single word about segregated schools. Well, perhaps, Professor Kelly, they knew the 14th Amendment had outlawed Jim Crow. Come on. What? They just took segregated schools for granted. This is a goddamn wild goose chase. Excellent job, Alex. It's clear, sir, that the framers of the 14th Amendment deliberately avoided being direct or explicit. So you'd say they left it inconclusive? It's 1866. There was almost no public effort to educate Negroes or whites. The framers never gave a thought to segregated schools one way or the other. But the language of the amendment is deliberately broad and elastic to allow for future conditions the framers could not anticipate. So you're saying they left the door open for either the Congress or the court to act? Sir, in good conscience, I'd say they left it a gray area in the Constitution. The court will have to interpret. I don't know what I'm gonna do. There's certain to be four firm votes to reverse Plessy. And maybe four to affirm. That leaves me. Well, Felix, you abhor segregation. Don't you see? I cannot cast a deciding vote. Well, why on earth not? I'm a noisy little foreigner. The agnostic, the Jew. Some may Jews as much as Negroes. Felix, what are you saying? It's what they say. Tommy Jew. Alien radical. Well, but that was all in the past, Go dear. back to Austria. Felix! A dirty little... Stop this! I cannot cast a deciding vote, Marion. There's already so much anger, so much hate crammed in this business. Expose it'll blow us apart. It won't just shut down the public schools, it could destroy the court. Surely it won't come to that. If we order desegregation, dear heart, who will enforce it? The army? I love this country, Marion. And you know how much I love the court. I'm afraid. Hello. Yes, Hugo. When was this? I see. Yes, of course. Good night, Hugo. Fred Benson. Just had a heart attack. He's dead. Chief Earl Warren. 
My God, another politician. So I said, I think it's your best choice. And he says, oh, no, don't ever put me on that witness stand. I'm my own worst enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Justice Frankfurter, it is a pleasure and a privilege, sir. With the consent of the brethren, I'm going to ask you, Hugo, as senior justice, if you will preside over this conference so that the new boy can get his feet wet without getting in over his head. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, yes. May I interrupt? Well, I'm, uh, I'm finishing a memo. I need some sound advice. Not on a point of law, on a decent place to eat. Well, the, uh, the jockey club is good. Uh, Chez Albert or Sans Souci. Uh, try with Sans Souci first. Would you be free to join me? Why, yes. Yes, I would. After the Civil War, the South used every means available to keep the ex-slaves poor, disenfranchised, and ignorant. As close to slavery as possible. School segregation was just a logical outgrowth of that general effort. That's certainly true. But, ladies and gentlemen, we must face the fact that we still have no persuasive evidence that school segregation was specifically prohibited by the 14th Amendment. Just the same, although they were eroded in the decades following their adoption, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were clearly intended to establish equality. So what you're really saying is that all we have to argue with at this point is broad purposes. You've already done that. Yes, <clears throat> but did they hear it? Now, Your Honors, the framers of the 14th Amendment clearly intended it to establish equality. And we contend this court has, at certain times, recognized in the 14th Amendment that broad purpose. Now, to support that contention, I would like to review two groups of cases. First, the court's rulings on racial classification laws. Mr. Second, Marshall. I don't believe we are troubled by our decisions in those cases. Yes, sir, Mr. Justice Jackson. The question is, and always has been, is it proper for the courts to overrule segregation laws? Is it right for this court to do that instead of... Leaving it to Congress. Exactly. I don't want to see you waste your time. Well, in fact, in 1871, Congress passed a law specifically aimed at enforcing the 14th Amendment, saying that anyone using a state law to deprive a citizen of his rights... I don't know what that act has to do with our problem. If you expect to prevail here, you must stick to what flows directly out of the 14th Amendment, not some subsequent congressional action. Yes, sir. The, uh, the only way my opponent can win here uh, is to prove that the 14th Amendment had not been intended to cover schools. And they forfeited... Mr. Marshall, if you should prevail here, before you finish, you must address this. Have you developed a plan for how desegregation would take place? Mr. Justice Frankfurt here. We, we cannot, uh, intelligently that is, uh, put, put forth a single plan that would fit all situations. Yes, but have you thought how much desegregation would be enough? Have you addressed the administrative problems? How much time would you allow for compliance? 
And who would you have to enforce it? Well, those questions would require a little time to work out. Perhaps a number of months. Your Honors, frankly, it is also beyond our imagination to conceive how the court would implement a desegregation order. In, for instance, Clarendon County, South Carolina, there are 2,700 black students and only 300 white ones in that county. Now, if there were 27 Negro students and only three white ones in each and every classroom, would their lives be more serene? Ironically, in Clarendon County today, you have equal education. Not promised, not prophesied, but present. Now, shall it be thrown away on some fancied question of racial prestige? Now, contrary to Mr. Marshall's statement, the basic question is not whether the 14th Amendment was designed to grant equal protection to the Negro. Everyone acknowledges that. The question is whether separate facilities, if they are equal, satisfy that guarantee. Now, this court has ruled not once, but seven times over the years in favor of the separate but equal doctrine. Now, somewhere, sometime to every principle, there comes a moment of repose, a time when it has been so often announced, so confidently relied upon, so long continued that it passes the limits of judicial disturbance. We feel strongly that the separate but equal doctrine has reached that moment. Thank you, Your Honors. Charlie Houston would have booted me out of law school for such a fumbling, dim-witted display. You got tomorrow. All the time you need. It's not how much time I need. They've had almost 200 years to figure it out. Hell, there isn't anything I can tell them that they don't already know. Now, Your Honors, I got the feeling listening here yesterday that when you put a white child in a school with colored children, that child is going to fall apart. Now, we all know that this is not true. You know, same kids in South Carolina and Virginia, they play in the streets. Together. They play on the farms. Together. They go down the road. Together. And they separate to go to school. 
They come out of school and they play ball together. But they must be separated in school. There's some magic to it. Now, this court has said that black and white are entitled to vote together, to live in the same housing developments. You have said, let them attend the same universities, law schools, nursing schools. But if they attend the same elementary and high schools, the world will fall apart. Yesterday, Mr. Davis said that he feared the only thing Negroes were after was prestige, status. Exactly correct. We do want that, and why shouldn't we? Why should our being black deny us what others in this country take for granted? Your Honors, this country fought a tragic, bloody civil war over the question of our status. And not one, but three amendments to the Constitution were passed in the wake of that war to settle the question of our status once and for all. The 14th Amendment specifically promised equal status. It was the Negro Bill of Rights. What had been left out of our Constitution had finally been put in. Our otherwise extraordinary Constitution was finally complete. No longer would we be denied the right to be free, I mean, to take charge of our own lives, to become a proud and an aspiring people. Well, we all know that some states made a mockery of those sacred promises. And in 1896, the Supreme Court of the United States said, that's all right. The Plessy decision was and is a fraud, nothing more than a license to discriminate, to perpetuate the inequalities and injustices of slavery. And now is the time for this court to say that is not what our Constitution stands for. The only way this court can decide for the defendants is to say Negroes are inferior to all other human beings. Now, nobody will stand up in this court and urge that openly. But for a court in this country today to deny that enforced racial segregation is a badge of inferiority, why? They are shutting their eyes as judges to what they must surely know as men. If this court denies our appeal, that is the message you will be sending to us. and to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. As you all know, Justice Black has been called Alabama because of a family illness. Stan. I believe the Constitution is a living document, and that the equality 
for the Negro has not been achieved under the separate but equal amendment. But I'm still convinced it can be. The fact is, the Constitution says nothing either about education or segregation. Now, I, I have no doubt that segregation is painful to Negroes. But how do we do right by the Negro without undermining the integrity of this court? Precisely. Then there's the vexing problem of remedy, which would have to deal with the deep and possibly violent passion of desegregation would be met with. I'm not ready to overturn. Well, with Hugo's vote, I count four to reverse, one to affirm, and three undecided. Like all of you, I have given this a great deal of thought. I have concluded that the only honest way that segregation can be sustained is to insist that the Negro is inherently inferior. And that is unthinkable. So I believe the time has come to end segregation in the public schools. Now given the deep feelings about this issue, this court must not act in an inflammatory way, but act it must. And it is my fondest hope that we can find a way to speak as a united court in one clear voice. Brethren, I hope that I will have the benefit of your ideas and wisdom in this endeavor. So, it looks as if we're down to the question of remedy. How to enforce compliance. I know you can't separate the principle from the remedy. And a timetable is crucial. We can't expect people to change overnight. Of course. But you see, the problem is, once somebody has a right, he has it instantly. Nothing you could do about that. Well, I don't see how we can get around it. Felix, let me get to the point. I'm going to draft an opinion on these cases. I see. You know how important it is to bring this court together. You know four brethren will go with me simply because reversing Plessy is fair. I know I can't pull the others along unless they're convinced it's judicially viable. Of course. And they'll look for your assessment of that, Felix. I'm convinced. At the heart of this matter is the problem you're fighting in your mind. Why not share some of it with us? A memo, you mean? I think it would help. And perhaps you could think creatively about the problem of timetable and framing a remedy. Let me know. Regarding a decree in the school segregation cases before the court, I offer these thoughts in the hope they may stimulate good thoughts in others. The equality of laws enshrined in the Constitution was made for an undefined and expanding future, and for a people gathered and to be gathered from many nations and many tongues. Thus, it is not a fixed formula. Law must respond to changes in men's feelings for what is right and what is just. When a deeply rooted state policy is wrong, the court does its duty if it reverses the direction of that policy so as to uproot it with all deliberate speed. Now, what in the hell does that mean? It means gradually. He borrowed that from Oliver Wendell Holmes. That's <laughs> 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 very good. So, Bob, the old tigger is bouncing back, is it? Well, it's better, thank you. You know, Earl, it's very humbling coming face to face with one's mortality. Very astute move circulating Felix's memo. Well, a great justice once said that the 
majestic generalities of the Constitution have a content and significance that vary from age to age? Benjamin Cardozo, right? Yes. I like what he said about a great principle growing into the promise of its logic, that someday all men are created equal might mean just that. Stan? Earl? I know it isn't easy deciding what's best for your country. I don't envy you. You're all alone on this one. I know. I wish you could come with us. I wish it were possible. Well. The Honorable the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oye, oye, oye. All persons having business before the Honorable the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. I have for announcement the judgment and opinion of the court in number one, Oliver Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka. We cannot turn the clock back to 1868 when the 14th Amendment was adopted, or even to 1896 when Plessy versus Ferguson was written. Today, Education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. In these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Such an opportunity, where the state has undertaken to provide it, is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. The segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race deprive the children of the minority group of educational opportunities? We believe it does. To separate Negro children from others of similar age, and qualifications solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community which may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. Any language in Plessy versus Ferguson contrary to this finding is rejected. We conclude unanimously that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. This is overdue, but uh, nonetheless, we are happy with the results. See you there, all right. <laughs> Yeah.
Very funny. I would say very funny. Hello. Congratulations, Mr. Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Davis. You argued with skill and great passion, and obviously that carried the day. You must be very grateful. Grateful. No, sir, I'm happy. Very happy, but I'm not thanking anybody. Nobody gave us anything today. What we got is ours by right. Simple justice. Well, Mr. Marshall, perhaps we'll meet again someday. Very gracious of you to call. Goodbye. Goodbye. What was that all about? Bob, I've got the feeling that tomorrow the real work begins. But tonight, I'm gonna have a couple. And then, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna have, have a couple, couple more. more. A year later, the court ordered public schools to desegregate with all deliberate speed. It took 10 years in Virginia and in South Carolina, too. Make no mistake, though, the Brown decision made all the difference in the world. For over 300 years, we had been either slaves or second-class citizens. Brown said, in effect, we were equal before the law. That's what we heard. That's what it said. The law was finally on our side.
This is PBS.